morning and, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, very, very interesting project and I sometimes <coughs> ask myself, where, what, is, what is the why, the project why? What does this mean, the why part? Um, so because it was about critical thinking, I, I inferred that perhaps it was W-Y, W-H-Y. You know, that's what we ask when we do critical thinking. Why, why is this going on? But the why could sometimes stand for youth, you know, the young. The young are our future. Actually, our family believe that what little kids are doing on their uh, smartphones, uh, they're actually showing us new ways of living. And we're, we're already behind the curve, not, not just me, I'm already over the curve. But even, even younger people here, already, we actually need to learn from what very young children are doing. I think it's quite going to be part of our future. But, but Y could also perhaps be sent for yes which would be the opposite of X. X meaning no. So I don't quite know but I, <laughs> what the Y refers to, but maybe, maybe all of these things. So I was, I was allocated two students. Um, one of them immediately is thought he dropped out after a while because of his many commitments. The other one, Vincent Bamba, completed his essay. Um, and it was quite an inspiring experience. So these were students not in my area. Uh, I met with them both. We had a short introductory meeting and asked they to tell me about their life stories. And uh, something uh, quite remarkable happened. They both of them began to speak about their, their path to study, to, uh, to success in their undergraduate degrees. In the one case, it was a, a story of succeeding despite many meant, uh, many uh, uh, of, of, this, of the students their friends and colleagues trying to stop him succeeding, saying, you, you are not going to be different to us. You will, you will never succeed. And he had to fight against this negative uh, communication in his peer group. The other, the other case was diametri diametrically the opposite. In this case, the student just succeeded because he had a working environment, his uh, internship in an engineering factory, where people encouraged him to study further, to do a postgraduate, to do a degree and a postgraduate degree. And in both cases, the importance of the social context became absolutely clear. In both cases, these were people with young young guys with real spirit, real energy, and in one case, this person had to overcome the negative impact of what people around him were saying. And in the other case, he was inspired by the support, but was clearly a very dynamic and brilliant person who was going to succeed no matter what. So uh, it seems to me that, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what I think critical thinking is, but in both cases, it seems to me there's a dimension of life in a university which we tend to underestimate. And these are the so psychosocial dimensions to do with affect, to do with um, your, your, your self-concept, to do with self-belief, and to do with internal obstacles to success, those inner demons uh, which haunt people and, and uh, of which we all have some. And it seems to me there's an inner dimension, a process inside ourselves which allows us to succeed. And, we, and many of our students are battling with these inner processes, with these inner demons, with, with histories, with poverty, with abuse in families, and often they do not succeed. We know that the dropout rate at universities is, is over 50%. So in a way, the people, not only is this a very small sample, but it's, uh, it's really not a representative sample because one has to ask those students who are dropping out, why? Why is that happening? And are we doing enough to support them? Are we paying enough attention to the psychosocial, the inner, the, the wrestling with self, the wrestling with demons, and with the immediate psychosocial environment? Your peers, your colleagues, what are they saying to you? How are you interacting with them? And I think these dimensions are often underemphasized. But, um, you know, my, I've, I've, uh, I've Supervised 11 PhD students, I've got another six on the go at the moment, and some 14 or 15 master students, and many
many of those successful postgraduate students, 80% of them are black, but 70% of them are from other countries. The, the African black South Africans are struggling, we know this. And I, so I've, I've managed to recruit relatively few. Those who have succeeded have generally had to wrestle with a massive self-confidence problem, a lack of belief in self. It's not their ability. They are, you know, probably brighter than I am. But they wrestle with a self-confidence problem, particularly when it comes to writing in another language. And how do you work with a student to develop their self-belief, to develop their confidence? so that they can emerge out of it really believing in themselves. It's actually key to them succeeding in the venture to begin with. Never mind you know, what happens after that. So I realized in my experience with supervising students that, again, it's, it's how we relate to one another, and it's how someone can develop that self-belief to overcome these inherited obstacles. And these are often very lonely and in individual struggles. Often the model of a of a postgraduate thesis in our universities, particularly at PhD level, particularly in the social sciences and humanities, is of a single student and a supervisor. That's the key relationship. And I think it's, that, that helps to make it this lonely and often very taxing individual struggle. So, as a result of getting a, a Saatchi chair and recruiting a number of students at the same time, a large cohort of 14 students starting out at exactly the same time, I began to experiment with creating a new kind of cohort, a new way of relating, students relating to one another in a kind of, uh, what, we, what would be perhaps be a lab in the, in the, in the physical uh, sciences creating an environment in which people were able to learn from each other as well as from me. People, an environment in which people are able to support each other. And I've, it actually has been quite remarkable. The fact that we, I mean, in the, my first cohort, people were located around the country, so I had to fly them in for a few weeks at a time. The second cohort, everyone was based in Cape Town, and we spent a year basically reading, uh, spending, <coughs> reading about 200 pages a week. But what began to emerge out of this process is the formation of a new kind of self-belief in I can do this, I can succeed, other people are succeeding, we can learn from each other and we can support each other. And it set up a new kind of dynamic. And my colleagues at uh, the institute that I work class are now experimenting with this model as well and we're managing to raise money to bring people together Often students from around Africa, so it's expensive to fly them in, but putting them through reading workshops, theory workshops, methodological workshops, and building that new kind of so uh, social environment, I think has made an enormous difference. It seems to me that at universities we need to pay more attention to these other dynamics. It's not just about the information, it's not just about the reading, it's not just about the thinking, it's the feeling part of it which is as important. And I wonder if we're doing enough. I think we should actually realize that we do have something called a duty of care. These are young people coming to universities, often from troubled backgrounds, who've struggled against adversity, against poverty, they, and it's very difficult. Do we realize that? Do we provide enough support for them? Do we uh, act on, do we implement our duty of care sufficiently? Um, so I think there's a kind of nurturing dimension to the work we do, which is underestimated. And as academics, we have no training in it. We have no background in it. We're subject matter specialists. And I think we could perhaps, as an institution, provide more skills and expertise to lecturing cell in how to work with students who often have great difficulties. So. And I want to um, reflect on one experience, um, a big experience which affected all of us over the last few years, where the, the notion of a duty of care and what it might mean in practice, I think is a, is a, is a core, a central issue. And this is the Fees Must Fall movement, okay, which was very traumatic in, in 2015 and 2016 in particular. Uh, and in talking about it, I want to be critical. 
in a way, I want to uh, model what it is to be critical, critical thinker rather than a critical spirit, but also to demonstrate something that can be very uncomfortable to be critical. To be critical is to say, I don't believe this to be the case. I think you're wrong. This thinker is wrong. This, this argument is wrong. Or this, this behavior is not helpful. And to be critical is often to set up um, tension between people. So it's not all hinky dorky like. It's not all, you know, we're all just being creative and being critical. Actually, it can be quite uncomfortable, which is why dialogue, the notion of dialogue is so important. So let me reflect on Fiesma School. And the context here is just one aspect, which is the students who were arrested for various uh, and uh, allegedly for, for certain kinds of crimes in that period, and what's happened to them. So I've been part of a, a support group which was set up to help students raise money for, in the first instance, bail, so that you can go get out of, uh, not sit in, in, in jail, but to continue with their studies. And in the second instance, to try and secure them uh, legal representation. And this is a very, very small group. Um, we've opened a bank account, and we've actually raised quite a lot of bail money and help to get people out of prison, in one case, Colesmore Prison, with uh, hardened criminals back into the university. Um, we've also managed to secure them legal representation, firstly through the Black Lawyers Association, but also through some private practitioners working pro bono, uh, and in some cases, um, legal aid. It's been a mixed experience, but over these, over 2015, 16, and 17, I want to talk about 47 students who've been brought before the courts. Uh, not one of these students have been found guilty today. Of the 47 students, 14 have been acquitted. 24 had their charges withdrawn. Another 8 uh, accepted the option of diversion, which is saying, I'll take some responsibility and I will do community service or I will discharge an obligation to society in some other way. There's one uh, trial still continuing. In all these cases, um, in some, the, the eight students have accepted responsibility have clearly said, I, I acknowledge what I did, and I accept that I was wrong. But in the other 39 cases, most of them, the students were totally innocent. And that's why they've been either acquitted or charges have been withdrawn. So here comes the critical part. Who was supporting these students other than the very small staff student support group? No one. Well, that's not quite true. The Legal Resources Center provided some advice, for example, about getting legal aid, which is free, and also helped us get in touch with a private attorney who's provided some services. The university did nothing to help these people, these students. The student movements did nothing. The SRC did nothing. And most of these students felt abandoned. And in particular, I want to talk about the 24 students who were rounded up by the police in their residences, often out of their rooms in 2016, hauled off to the police station and charged with violent conduct and assault, many of them completely innocent, with no convincing evidence whatsoever. Many of those students were doing things like accounting. They were not political students. Many of them have felt extremely traumatized. Many of them could not get holiday jobs because they had a criminal charge against them. They struggled to pay their fees. They felt their entire futures were at risk. Where was our institution at this moment in time? So this is a very dramatic example of us not paying enough attention to our duty of care. And I think we need to reflect on that, and whether, what we need to be doing in such cases. Now, it's not for want of trying that uh, we've been forced to, to go to, to private lawyers or to legal aid or to, uh, to the Black Lawyers Association, because appeals to the university fell on deaf ears. The university's legal advisor said, these cases have got nothing to do with us. Um, this is a criminal matter. Talk to the police. And I think that's an abandonment 
of our students. That's a case of abdicating our duty of care. And let me just say that if, when you work with students in these kinds of contexts, you get to know them quite well. And even those students who did things which they shouldn't have done, once you get to know them, you realize that they are much like any other student. They're young, they're idealistic, they sometimes have silly ideas and bad ideas, but they're not basically bad people. But by allowing them to go through these traumatic experiences, we are actually encouraging them to, to not believe in our institutions, to not believe in our values. We're encouraging them to think that nobody's really interested in them. Which I think is a, has many negative impacts. So, so this is a very uh, particular example, a dramatic example, and maybe it's making you feel uncomfortable, which is what critical thinking often does. Um, and maybe we need to have much more conversation about this at some other, at some other time. But it relates to my point about paying attention to the actual experience of, of students in our universities and how we can support them to overcome their enormous practical disadvantages and difficulties in order to succeed. And to the extent that we are encouraging critical thinking in them, we must accept that sometimes they're going to be critical of ourselves, and critical of our institutions, which is what the Fees Must Fall student is all about. So it's, it's, it's nice to encourage critical thinking. What if people stand up and say, but actually you're ignoring this, you're not, you're, you're, you're not uh, portraying the situation accurately, you're wrong. Are we prepared to accept those criticisms? I think the Fees Must Fall student had many negative aspects of one very powerful thing which was absolutely positive. It drew our attention to the enormous financial problem we've, we have been facing with regard to students of being able to afford higher education in a way which we never quite realized before. And that's been enormously positive. So I think we have to thank them for that, even though there were many other things about it which are, not, are, are, are far from admirable. So, if one can accept that sometimes the criticism of oneself is correct, I think there's a great deal to learn from being criticized. Of course, we need to engage, and we need to criticize others in turn. We need to examine those arguments and say, do they, are they valid? Do they hold up or not? But that's the process of dialogue. So I think these questions of critical thinking as well as creative thinking in the context of dialogue is the challenge. So a big challenge here at, at UWC. This is a tiny project. I mean, it's a mere handful of students. I think there's a very important issue. How do we go to scale? How can we build this kind of endeavor into everything we do? And I think the key role is, uh, the, 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 the key to this Vivian, is going to be leadership from the university. And of course, the real practical difficulties that uh, we academics face in terms of the pressures on our time are also very real. It's not just a matter of appealing us, appealing to us to you know give up our, our free time. It's actually making it practically possible. So, just to conclude, I think this has been a very worthwhile project, Project One, but it's raised a much bigger set of issues with major implications for the whole institution which I think we have to take on board and, and, and think about how we do this at scale. Thank you. So you've just experienced critical thinking and the critical thinking process. Thank you, Ben. It just made make one uncomfortable. But that's what universities are. Change is uncomfortable. No one likes to stay the same. If you don't change quickly as an institution, we're not going to be we're not going to be very relevant for very long. So thank you for that. So to end now, I'm going to ask Big Ben, Matiba, uh, to talk to us about what critical thinking has meant to him. His essay is in the book, but he's going to praise it for you and just describe what it's like to be a student here. As Prof Ben was saying, some of the difficulties. This is one very small subsample, and I always said that Ben, it was only a small subsample. We did ask for more, but we only had a few volunteers. But here's one, and here's a spectacular volunteer. So thank you, Ben. Well, 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, my name is Ben. I'm actually completing my master's in bioinformatics. And last year, when actual day project started, I was in America. And the email was sent to a few students, which I was one of them. But I was like, oh my gosh, I won't be able to make this because I was going to be in the US for three months. And the project was going to start just like <coughs> one week after I left South Africa already. And then I asked of Lona if she could actually postpone the project so that I can participate in the workshop. Um, luckily, there was a postponement. And when I came back from the US, I actually um, had time to actually participate in this project. So when I went to the workshop, the facilitator actually had a way of breaking through us as students. See, we came out there with agendas and maybe with some ideas or what's going on or what's going to happen and stuff like that, kind of shy, timid. But she really had a way of coming to us in a way that really made me to feel like I should also be humble like her. She really taught us how to listen with the intent of understanding and coming to understand where the person comes from who is in front of you, instead of listening with the intention of just replying. So this is something that I've been also practicing since last year, to just listen without taking notes, to just listen without commenting, to just listen without putting words in your mouth, and just see how you can be. Because sometimes as scientists, we tend to know the hand of the speech or the hand of the sentence of someone before even they finish it. And that could also be very good, but it could also be very bad. So in that workshop, they were trying to let us know how we can transform our weaknesses into our strength. So to my today's speech, I have three counts. The first count is um, my views of critical thinking, and the second is how this critical thinking workshop or the why project has impacted me. And the last one is how can this project be extended to benefit the undergrads. So I was actually my speech last year, but for some reason last year I was not really that settled. And my speech last year was not really that good, to be honest. So this year I was like, okay, the DVC and both the, uh, DC has given me another opportunity to, 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 to read again to you guys my speech. So I had time to edit it and twist around things and see how I could make it better. So, the first count is my critical views, I mean my views of critical thinking. To answer to this question, I want to bring you guys back a little bit to my personal journey, to my personal life, so that you can understand where I come from and where I am from today, uh, where I am today. So, um, there are some people in this world that have been lucky enough to have parents or grandparents who have made it in life and they have established a path for them. People for whom going to school was never a dream. For whom eating an adequate meal every day is taken for granted. The parents have made it and they are destined to make it in life as well. Others grow up in misery that can only be understood once lived, once experienced. This kind of misery teaches the soul that poverty is something that cannot be changed. It teaches the mind to be and remain passive. It makes one forcefully believe in the being subhuman and its genetically mutates the existential power of our mind. By the time that I was 11, my parents found themselves on a fast downward slope, like a car on a steep hill with no brakes, where fatality is doomed to happen. While I was at this very young age, my parents were my safe heaven. They had the rod pulled out from under them. Mobutu's government was overthrown in 1997, and this period of political unrest was accompanied by rampant looting and inflation. My dad's business crumbled under the mess of circumstances, and my parents' decisions since that time have defined our life path. My parents, having hit rock bottom, dragged all of us along with them. We were broke and miserably broken. 
And despite all of this, my mother continued to have children. We didn't know what lunch, breakfast, or summer meant, but we knew how many children we were becoming. My dad and my mom still cannot recount this event without them being emotional because it is a story of our life. I never had a childhood. I never understood what to be a teenager meant. We were broke and miserably broken. And despite all of this, my mother and my parents, they have no way to get out of poverty. And sometimes when I look into the album pictures, because I, don't have very, I have very, very few pictures of my teenagers, all of them, there is none of them that you can find me smiling at those pictures. So I didn't know how to smile when I'm taking the picture. The state of extreme poverty took its toll on my parents. We were treated so badly, showered with hurtful words and negative criticism that crushed us every single day. We were raised to have no self-esteem. We were physically abused and whipped as a method of education to learn that discipline with violence was the only way to become obedient children. However, what it really felt to us was that we were not worthy. We were the cause and the curse of our parents' misfortune. We were ostracized by our own families, our own uncles, and our own aunties, even our own churches. Our house was called chicken coop by others who mocked our misfortune. I felt my life was doomed for failure. One day, as I sat, thinking under a mango tree in the shade, bare feet, bare chest, with wild and tanned hair. I happened to spot a broken piece of mirror not far from where I sat. And I looked into it and I saw myself in the small piece of mirror. My face was very depressed and I remember telling myself, I have become the boy that I have watched my society create. I have become the carbon image of my parents and of my family and of my society. As I looked at myself into the mirror, I said, I am going to rescue myself. Not my parents, not my uncles, not my families. I am going to rescue myself. Going through this kind of life bankrupts one mind in every single stinking man. I had no pride to protect. I had no personality to safeguard. And every potential I had was completed I completely destroyed throughout the years. The idea that I had a innate gift has never crossed my mind. And as such, I was not doing anything with my critical thinking. I looked at myself at 14 years old in that mirror and I said, I am going to rescue myself. I am going to transform myself. I have never asked to be born, least of all to be born in such chaos. Being an underprivileged kid, growing up in a chicken coop with parents who are broke and broken, in a country with the most corrupt governments, a country that is torn by war, a country that is experiencing a forgotten genocide, I had 100% chances to become myself a chaos. And at no point along the line I have stopped being me, because people stuck a finger in my face and told me that I was not good enough. And when the situation became difficult, I did not start looking for someone to blame. I understood back then that the world is not always made of sunshine and rainbows, but it can be a very mean and horrible place, and it doesn't care how soft or tough you are. It will beat you to your knees and keep you on your knees permanently if you let it. But it is not about how hard you can hit back at life that matters. What actually matters is how life can hit you and you still can keep showing up. How badly you can be destroyed by life circumstances and you still pushing forward. If you know what your price is, go out and get what you deserve. But you must be willing and prepared to take the hit and keep showing up without pointing fingers and whining about not being where you wanted to be because of this or that or someone else. 
Only people with no critical thinking play the victim. But when you make use of critical thinking, you have to adapt. You have to improvise. And you shall overcome. Critical thinking begins with questioning reality. How a